the oral history interview of Edward Samuel Deach of the 17th Armored Infantry Battalion, 12th Armored Division, World War II, at the 65th Reunion, Washington, D.C., August of 2011. First, I want to thank you for agreeing to sit with me and take an interview, sir. Well, you're certainly welcome. <laughs> and uh, let's just start at the beginning. What did you do before you entered the Army? Where were you when the war started? I was in the optical business, and uh, I had been there from 1938 to 42, and of course was drafted December the, December the 23rd, two days before Christmas. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I was shipped to uh, Camp Mead, and my first job uh, I got was sweeping sparks off the tents. They had these little egg stoves in there and sparks would come out, but it was raining and hailing. You couldn't start a fire with a gasoline can. <laughs> and that my duty was to get out there and sweep those sparks off from 12 o'clock to 4 in the morning. <laughs> so that was my first uh, initiation in the Army. <laughs> now tell me about going from a civilian job <coughs> like the optical business into the Army, how did you adjust? Did you adjust pretty well? Yeah, I had no problem. I had no problem. And the, uh, of course, eventually I wound up at Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and picked up the 12th Armor there, and I was put into the 56th Armored Infantry. And the irony of that was my father in World War II was in the 56th Pioneer Infantry. <laughs> so uh, from there we went uh, at Camp Campbell, we were shipped out to, after maneuvers at Camp Campbell, we shipped out to Camp Barkley. Mm -hmm. And now, that's where we did the rest of our training. Yep. Tell me a little bit about uh, moving to Texas and uh, how you found the area. Hot and dry. <laughs> Hot and dry. The one thing I remember most when we were on maneuvers, the vehicles moving along the road it looked like they were splashing water, but it was dust. And it was about 101, 102, and we were thirsty, and supposedly had been cut off from our kitchen unit. So helicopters come over to drop us something to eat. So we all got our sandwich and opened up peanut butter. <laughs> we couldn't even spit cotton balls. <laughs> and they gave us peanut butter sandwiches. So that was the beginning of Army life, real Army life. <laughs> now, tell me about your uh, trip from there up to Camp Shanks by train. Uh, we, we went from Camp Barkley. Actually, from Camp Barkley, we, we uh, entrained to New York. Mm -hmm. And we got on, we were boarded on the Empress of Australia. And then, of course, we supposedly were supposed to land in France, but uh, the 4th Armored Division took quite a beating, and they had used up a lot of our equipment that was sitting there waiting for us. So we had to spend two weeks in England until they were able to get some equipment to replace what they used of ours. Anything you can tell me about the trip itself on the ship? I've, I've heard a couple of good stories about it. Uh, on the Empress of Australia? I think they just got through hauling cattle and they didn't hose it down yet. <laughs> it, and they had tables marked for 10, 10 persons and we had to get down in the hold and put about 20 there with full field pack on that table. <laughs> so it, it was, it was kind of crowded going over, and I think it took about 17 days to cross. Instead of landing at Le Havre, we landed over on the England side because we had to wait for equipment. Mm -hmm. But we were there, I guess, about two weeks. Mm -hmm. So finally, the trip across the channel to France. To yeah, and that was, and our ship didn't get over there till about one in the morning, something like that. And, the, and we had full field pack, Duffel bag, take over one of these Jacob's ladders, rope ladders, carrying all this stuff. 
that was scary because <laughs> those ships were sitting pretty high up out of the water. But uh, from there, we uh, had our other equipment waiting. We had to decrease it and clean it up. And then we went on up into battle. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure where we hit our first encounter. But now, from, it was in France, of course. Now, as a member of the 17th Armored Infantry Battalion, what was your combat duty? Were you a rifleman? No, I was a combat medic. We were in the combat medical detachment. Not the 82nd, now the, this was the 17th Armored Infantry Medical Detachment. And every time a company went into battle in, uh, say, AM, we had to get aid men to follow the infantry in so they'd be right there to give them first aid. So we put maybe three or four men to a company when they went into battle. And uh, we had some sit back with these reserve. And of course, we, they set up a an aid station that wasn't the 82nd, the 82nd was behind us. And uh, of course from there we replaced men that were lost and uh, the, the medical detachment had, had quite a few uh, lost men, they really did. Can you tell me about your first combat experience or uh, what you recall of it? Well, I know we were in some French town, and the Germans start shelling us. So everybody had to get off the streets and got out of the half tracks, and and took to the cellars of the French homes. And the next morning, when our artillery got into play, then we moved forward and we start going forward and uh, taking town after town. I couldn't quite remember what towns they were. But I do remember going through Alsace Lorraine because my father used to talk about Alsace Lorraine when he was with the Pioneer Infantry. So that was kind of a weird feeling. My me going through the same town that he was going through. Yeah. Now, in our previous discussions we talked about your role in the Battle of Hurlisheim. That that was yeah, that was quite a battle. Um, when I got it, I was running up to get into Harlesheim. Our outfit was hung up, met a lot of fire right at the very edge of town. And I can remember to my right, I was just running past burning tanks, our tanks, and maybe maybe a dozen of them or whatever. And by the time I got up into the very, big, well, it was the end of the street of Harlesheim, there were houses on both sides, single houses, and maybe 20, 30 feet between them. And as soon as I hit the street, I had to climb through a window to get out of small arms fire and mortar fire they were throwing at us. And I do remember Major Logan, he made his headquarters, uh, uh, the CP, about three houses up, and we were like the second house up. They were, they were across the street and made their CP there, and eventually uh, we, we went out, if I can recall, we went out the side door, my buddy and I, we were the only two in that one house. And I think that was um, Sergeant Weller, Mar we called him Mort, Morris Weller. We went out the side door to run up to the street side to see if there was anybody we could help. Just as we got to the very edge of the house, two Germans popped out of the barn on the back and then on the hock we put our hands up and they, they were motioning to come in. They wanted us to come to the barn and they were holding these what we call burp guns, machine guns. And instead we did the thing we thought we'd get away with. We hit the ground and rolled in front of the house out of fire and they jumped back into the barn. And the tank was right in the next house, our, one of our tanks saw what was happening. So he moved his tank up, rotated his uh, cannon, put around into the barn. And with that, another German tank pulls out between houses up the street, and we clamber on through the window, afraid we're gonna be right in the middle of a tank battle. Well, we heard the, the Tiger tank get off the first shot. We knew our man got hit. So we said, let's take a look, see what we can do, and I'm gonna see what, see what the tank is up to. 
when we found out what he was up to, he was rotating his 88 cannon to our window where we just clambered through. And I yelled to my buddy, out the window, and he ran across the room. I ran, got kicked in the face with his boots. But I got the, I felt the heat and the, and the concussion and was actually blown through the window. And I felt the pain in my foot. So we climbed back into the basement and hid in the basement. And it was dark, it got dark by that time. And we were hiding down in the basement with uh, Mort Weller and myself. And we could hear German voices outside walking around. We're expecting them to throw a grenade or something down the basement like we normally do, but nothing happened. So we stayed there till maybe three in the morning, something like that. So we'll go out the side door and we'll crawl till we get within that one burning tank. We didn't want to stand up because we would have been silhouetted against the uh, fire in the, on that tank still burning. So we crawled pretty much close to the tank and got up and ran. Well, they did open up with machine guns, but we were behind the tank by that time. And then we ran as much as we could to go, go back to our lines, and we crossed this little creek. It was ice, but it fell through, and we wanted the water up to our waist. But it felt good to me because my foot was really hurting, which happened to have a nail from the window that went right up through my boot. They found that out when they got me back to operate on that foot. And I had no, all I know is it, it hurt. <laughs> so uh, that was my episode there. And uh, I think Major Logan and his group, I think they all got captured at that time. Of course, they had, they had a German tank sitting right outside with the ga cannon right at the house and told them they're going to blow the house apart if they didn't come out. So they came out with their hands up. Of course, that all happened when we went down and hid in the basement of the, of the house, and then we escaped at night. And I wound up in a hospital, oh, I don't know how many miles behind the line it was. But when they got me back there, they just gave me ether, put me to sleep, got my boot off and the nail out, and fixed up my boot and uh, my foot. and. Uh, I was there for about 10 days, and I said, I'd like to be shipped back to my outfit, and uh, they did, they shipped me back. But uh, early shine, nobody forgets early shine. Okay. Kate, further along in the war after early shine, what else stands out in your mind? Do you, do you remember the, uh, the, the working with the French in the Colmar Pocket operation at all? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, tell me. Well, tell I me think, our biggest problem we ran into when we hit, we crossed the Inn River, and that bridge was intact. They, they knocked off a couple Germans trying to put dynamite under the bridge, but they got them before they could blow the bridge. And we got across, but when we got across, the lead vehicle, when it went around one of the curves in the mountain, the road was blown out. And <clears throat> the Germans were right on the other side of it, opened up with machine guns. And I think they, they killed the, the people who were in the jeep leading the column, and some in a half track. And as medics, we ran up forward to see what we could do to help somebody. And, and there was a little, sh what I called a sheep herder shack, a one room a shack, flat roof shack. And a lot of our guys were running in there. And we were, I was doing the downside of the mountain, yelling across the road, no. Don't go in, because we also had a half track sitting there with about six aerials up, and they were trying to hit that with a mortar, and also that little shack. And soon enough, they did put a mortar shell into that shack. And then they were yelling medics. I had to get up and get in there, and got about four of them out of there, and another one hit. That's when I got hit. Then my buddy came up with a jeep and got me back. And from that point on, I was in hospitals and going through surgeries. That was the second time I got wounded. Then I wound up in uh, Walla Reed Hospital. And when they flew me back to France, and then they put me on a ship, and then flew me from North Carolina up to uh, Walla Reed. And that's where I was discharged from. So it was an exciting trip, <laughs> to say the least. So, 
Where were you? Do you remember where you were when you got word that the war was over? Uh, you mean the one at Harlesheim? No, no, when VE Day. Uh, on, oh, VE Day. Hmm? VE Day, I see that was on the 8th, wasn't it? Hmm? I was in one of the hospitals, field hospitals, and they were flying me back to the ship, and then I got on a ship and went back to uh, the United States. Yeah, and I got back sometime in, uh, let's see, that was May the 3rd when I got hit the second time. Hospitalized May, June, July. I think I got back sometime around August on a ship. Uh, and then went shipped up to uh, Walla Reed. And I was there for about two weeks and then got a furrow to go home, but when I came back, then I was, I was discharged. Yeah, and I, I entered in December the 23rd, and that was in 1942. So it was a long trip. So what can you tell me about life after the war? Hell, a lot calmer than it was during the war. <laughs> I went right back to work in the optical business, the same place that I left. And I, I stayed there for about, <coughs> I guess maybe four years. And there was another company, uh, a small company, it wasn't a wholesale house. They actually made glasses for people and dispensed them, and optician. And they heard about me being back and somehow I got some information about the work I turned out. Well, they knew about some because we used to do some of their work. And uh, they wanted to hire me, and I said, well, I've been with this company so many years, and I hate to leave them. Then they start making the offer so sweet, it's hard to give up. They said, when are you going on vacation? I says, well, I'm going about uh, June the 1st. He said, how, many, how long are you going to be? I said, two weeks. He said, why don't you take a month, and we'll pay the other two. <laughs> so I got two weeks vacation out of it. Went to work with them. and. Retired for them in 1953, wasn't it? No, no, it couldn't have been 53. When you were 85. Yeah, I, I was, I know it was in my 80s when I retired. 84, yeah. And we still have contact with my employer while well, I work for these father, I work for his son, and I work for his grandson. Three generations of Appers. And we're still in contact with them. Uh, we became very good friends. Matter of fact, we'll be going up to his cabin in Deep Creek uh, in the end of July, is it? Or oh, September? Saturday. Oh, Saturday. You see how far behind I am? <laughs> yeah. But uh, we, we uh, maintain good friendship, we always got along very well. So uh, they treated me very well, that's why I stayed with them so long. Yeah. So we still have contact. Well, sir, I want to thank you again for sitting down with me and telling well, your story. I hope I haven't messed you up any. <laughs> <laughs>